Fantastic. That's chapter one. And I think maybe we'll just briefly go on to another topic, which is social transformation. And interesting, you talk about counterculture, and it does seem you have this dominant Confucian uh, uh, way that the society is set up with kind of power and striving and desire um, and kind of formal structures, and then Taoism being in a reaction to that. And I think environmentalists uh, in particular are drawn to Taoism because of this understanding that we've talked about, that we all come from the Tao. And we aren't just alien visitors on a dead planet. The plants and animals, the myriad things that we see around us are of the same type of intelligence and same type of stuff, being and non-being, that, that we are made up of. Uh, and so that connection. Um, I mean, the Tao Te Ching is interesting because it does seem to be written ex explicitly advising emperors about how to return the kingdom back to, to, to balance, the empire back to balance, and does give some kind of specifics on how to do that. It does feel that we are quite far from the way of nature in our kind of society where we exploit natural resources and human time to make goods and services oh, no. in order to continue desires rather than oh, no. creating a society where we meet our needs and uh, you know support each other and being content with who we are now. Um, so... I mean, there's stuff that if Lao Tzu was about today, we'd probably have a long list to, um, you know, wag the finger at. And um, how, how does a Taoist go about social transformation? Uh, um, yeah, what, what was the Taoist approach to try and return back to the way of nature? Yeah, this is a good question. And it confused me for quite a long time until I, I felt like I had a, a better understanding of what Taoists like Lao Tzu and Zhuang Tzu um, are up to maybe just a quick academic point uh, that in Lao Tzu's time there was no term Taoism. Mm. Uh, that is something that was applied later, and because some aspects of the Tao Te Ching and Zhuang Tzu seem to overlap, then people say, "Oh, let's call them the same kind of thing. Uh, we'll call them Taoists." Uh, but it's interesting that um, many philosophers in that period used the word Tao. Even later uh, in Zen Buddhism, um, they're constantly referring to Tao, uh, to the proper way of being in tune with society and with nature. Uh, so it's a very interesting and useful term uh, to indicate, uh, a, like you said, a proper balance between the individual and society and the individual and nature. Uh, and depending on which school of Chinese thought you're talking about, one of those can be emphasized more than another. So when it comes to, okay, I'm getting an understanding of Tao Te Ching and I feel like there should be a better balance in the world. What does that mean for me? Uh, and how can I go out and be a force for good in society? Uh, well, of course, Lao Tzu would right away caution against wanting to be a force for good, right? Because that can turn right back on you uh, and have unintended consequences. Um, so there's um, a notion that's buried a little bit uh, in Taoism of pluralism, that there should be a diversity. Um, there, there is a diversity in the world. Uh, there are patterns, but within those patterns, uh, there's also um, uh, a kind of individuality. So if you look, for example, um, if you have a maple seed, a seed for a maple tree, um, and you plant it and you nurture it, it will grow into a maple tree. Uh, it won't grow into an oak tree. It won't grow into a coconut palm. Um, but it will also grow into a different kind of maple tree from the one next to it. It will be the same kind of tree, but it will be, <laughs> it'll be subtly different. It'll be taller or shorter, have different uh, displays of branches. And, uh, and even the maple leaves themselves uh, will be slightly different. Um, and I think in, in Taoism, there's not as much emphasis on diversity or pluralism in the natural world as there could be when people are talking about it and discussing it. So what does this mean for the individual when I go out and I want to make the world a better place? I think what it means is you really need to understand who you are, uh, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, what your, what your tendencies are what your predilections are, uh, and then capitalize on the circumstances you have 
uh, and not force your way to do something that you think is maybe the right thing to do, but you're not equipped to do. Yes. Um, and to follow that path, so to speak, uh, that is your own and is not somebody else's. So I don't think there's a one size fits all answer to the question, what does a Taoist do in terms of the environment or in terms of social justice? Yes, nature seems to go into uh, a lot of effort to create uniqueness. And yeah, no maple tree is the same and no snowflake is, is, is the same. And, <laughs> you know, every one of our faces is you know, unique um, despite over 7 billion of us. Um, so it does seem to be, yeah, following nature uh, doesn't exclude individuality as something that has value in its own right. It seems to me if nature put that much effort into making us all unique, that is for, you know, to allow us to express ourselves. Yeah, unfortunately it doesn't allow for easy answers though, right? You can't just say step one, step two, step three, here's what a Taoist does. Yes, and, and one should be wary of the person who has the 10 step plan to save the world, because you know, a lot of right. evil has been done to, uh, in the name of saving the world, uh, which is Lance's point. Um, yeah. Can I just mention one thing? So yeah. as philosophers, we like to raise problems as well as to answer questions. Yeah. Um, so here's, here's a bit of um, controversy maybe that's worth thinking about. Suppose that the revolutionaries back in the day had been Taoist. Um, is that a contradiction in terms, right? Where it was Thomas Jefferson just following his own path uh, or was he somehow forcing going where he shouldn't have gone, right? His path maybe could have led her to an, led him to an easier place. Um, and and uh, somebody like MLK, right? Surely if he was going with the flow, maybe he could have done something that wouldn't have got him killed in the end uh, or JFK. I, I raise this question with my students sometimes is, is maybe a Taoist path a little bit too comfortable uh, for Taoists um, to, to do good. This isn't a question that I have an answer to. Um, I do have some thoughts about it, but I think it's the kind of thing that's worth throwing out there and letting other people think about. Um, if I'm a Taoist, is that really good for society in the end? Is, is Taoism about comfort? You live in the mountains right now, so maybe you can give an answer to yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> do you live a comfortable life there? Yeah, well, it's certainly an interesting question. And it's something I, I think about, um, you know, the, the middle way, uh, you know, is that the easier option? And, you know, it's all good to, um, you know, F the system, whatever a polite version of that is. Uh, but when you get ill, you're very grateful for the Western hospital, which is right. built upon right. the government and um, taxation. And uh, also manipulation of nature to a very high degree. Yes, of course. Um, and so, yeah, the question is, is, it, it may be in this kind of world that Lao Tzu wanted, one could be a Taoist, but given the complex uh, interdependent world that we live in on an individual city, household, planet um, level that we live on, then, you know, so for example, I do think about, um, you know, non-action Wu Wei with climate change, uh, for example. What is non-action in opposition to the kind of the steam train locomotive, which is the way we're currently setting ourselves up to extract resources. So is non-action or balance enough force the other direction to come back to balance? <laughs> or is there a, a, a Wu Wei, and a, you know, it's an interesting question I'm trying to think about, which is how to not force it while also taking, you know, the, the bridge has been blown up and we're about to drive ourselves off a cliff. So we should stop the train, but then, you know, what, how can we do it? in a Taoist way. Right, right, right. <clears throat> yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the easy answer is, well, I can just reduce my own desires uh, and, and make a, a, a little corner for myself in the universe and try to exploit it as little as possible. Um, that's not gonna stop the train, obviously, if, if I'm the only one who does it. Um, an interesting thing about the Tao Te Ching is it's not, even though there's an interesting focus on the individual and self-cultivation, like we've been talking about, <clears throat> what can I do for myself uh, to bring me into harmony with the universe? It seems to have been written for a ruler. Yeah. Uh, and the ruler in a traditional Chinese sense is not just 
the dictator of society, but a model for a society that people take their cues from the ruler. And this is something that modern psychology has confirmed as well, uh, that uh, I don't remember a few, you're probably too young to remember Charles Barkley, uh, the American basketball player. No. He was sort of a bad boy of basketball in the day. Uh, and people said, why don't you act more like a role model? And his answer was, I'm not a role model. Don't take me as a role model. Mm. Um, but the it's an open question. Actually, it's probably not true that you can just say you're not a role model when you're out in front of people because people will naturally take you as a role model. This is how human behavior works. We imitate the people around us, especially those that are well-placed in society. And so what Taoism and Chinese philosophy in general um, focus on is self-cultivation that allows you, as you advance in society, to improve society by improving yourself. That your actions will influence other people's actions. So even, even if I do decide that I'm just going to uh, reduce my desires and I'm going to <clears throat> be frugal and I'm going to live an environmentally responsible life, it's not, it, in the end, it's not just me. I'll be subtly influencing those people around me, whether I try to or not. So is the answer airdropping Dao De Jing copies of your illustrated book with Sai on the White House and <laughs> Downing Street? I don't, I don't think that's the answer. <laughs> we just get the book to the top. That's the answer. <laughs> I think that sounds like a very solid answer. Just, if it gets in the right hands, it could work wonders. Um, yeah, I mean, I certainly, I, I do... I mean, I think this is an interesting time because even in the selfish economic worldview, it's becoming increasingly in one's own interest to you know, see nature as something to protect rather than destroy because you know, it's all good having the bar of gold, but if the planet's burning, you can't benefit from it. Um, so um, it does seem the story is changing on, on, on many levels, and that is from individuals, you know, in the boardroom or you know on the internet and kind of the, the students that you have that that is that duh that virtue kind of resonating out um but yeah then the question is is it enough given how fast the locomotive's going yeah and if we remember the sign curve right that things are going up and down and things look pretty bleak now um chances are things will look better down the road but again it depends what your perspective is, right? So if we take an anthropomorphic perspective or an anthropological, what's the right word? Anthropocentric, that's the word. <laughs> if we take an anthropocentric perspective, um, then things look pretty bleak for humanity right now. Um, but is that the right perspective or the only perspective? People say we're destroying the earth. I don't think we're destroying the earth. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the earth will be fine. And I know, I'm sure there'll be beautiful three-eyed, bright yellow fish, <laughs> like in the Simpsons, coming out of the, the nuclear wasteland. It, it, it's partly a selfish yeah. desire. But I mean, the Taoists do see you know, humans as something, you know, that does, I mean, it depends on the interpretation, but like uh, heaven is good, earth is good, and humans are good. There does seem to be some um, elevation of humankind. Is that something you'd agree with? Uh, elevation, um, I think a, a realization that humanity has its value yeah. Yeah, is, uh, is, is in there. I'm not sure what more to say beyond that. Um, there, there are other competing passages, the, like Earth treats us as straw dogs. Mm. Uh, and uh, there's a this this actually passage is open to quite a bit of controversy. What is what does it mean to say that we're treated as straw dogs? Does it mean that we're um, invaluable or uh, not valuable in the big picture of things? Uh, that that humans are not elevated above other creatures, uh, and there are different ways that people try to um, come to terms with this passage. Uh, but there seems to be there's a few passages in the Tao Te Ching that suggest that. Um, there's a, what's the right word, impartiality yeah. uh, to nature. 
Uh, and that hu humans, um, we have our perspective, and of course, we're valuable from that perspective. But from the broader perspective of nature, um, we are just another part uh, of the universe. That, that's certainly what resonates with me. And yeah, it's interesting. I think um, the work of Jane Goodall that I've read, um, you know, the work with chimpanzees and seeing how they had things that we previously thought were exclusive to humans, like personalities, right. which all dog owners right. know, of course, different dogs have different right. personalities. Um, and yeah, our intelligence is you know, only different in degree rather than kind. Um, certainly something that resonates with me. Well, I think we could talk forever because you're such an interesting uh, person with so, so much wisdom and insight. Um, but that was a yeah, very rich conversation. I feel like we got very deep with the Tao and its characteristics and um, yeah, quite, quite a clear lesson and takeaway from social transformation, which is fire the Tao Te Ching, uh, a copy of your book onto the White House and Downing Street and uh, <laughs> the capitals around the world. Right. <laughs> I'm glad that's the conclusion of our conversation. <laughs> well, I hope uh, people watching this conversation enjoyed it. Um, I, I can't recommend these books enough. I think it's just an excellent um, kind of tool in your toolkit of, of understanding uh, the wisdom from, and it's not just the Tao Te Ching, which is going to be out uh, either on the day that this interview is released or, or, or soon, uh, but there's also the Analex and Zhuangzi, um, and they're all very fun to read. And uh, Brian, I think you've really done a fantastic job at keeping the humor and the lightness and yeah, it's really fantastic what you've done. So thank you for all the work that you do and for this conversation. Yeah, well, thank you for the attention. It's, uh, it's great to talk about this kind of thing. It's my favorite thing to do, so. All right. All the best, Brian. Thank you. Take care, George. Bye now. <laughs>